Our next speaker is Christopher D. Johnson, whom I know from his time as a uh, professor of comparative literature at Harvard. He is currently um, research associate at the Warburg Institute with the Bilder Fahrzeuge Group. Thank you very much, Peter. Um, I'm just going to jump right in. My talk is in five, four parts. And in a 1925 letter, Warburg offhandedly mentions our new research direction, which actually realizes an idea of Vico's. Though he never explains what he means, this sentence from the new science comes immediately to mind. Imagination is nothing but the springing up again of memories, and ingenuity or invention is nothing but the working over of what is remembered. As you know, the always memorious, always ingenious Warburg thought in polarities. But if culture is shuled by the first order polarity, whereby the artist or cosmographer balances the senses of emotional pull with reason's more sober claims, then I would argue today the second order polarity of hieroglyph and diagram shape Walburg's Kulturwissenschaft. Especially as it grapples with the astrological imagination, Walburg invents intervals in which interpretation oscillates between hieroglyph and diagram. This, to forge a heuristic open work, a work whose dynamic yet unfulfilled intermediality should be paradigmatic for contemporary humanists grappling with information overloads of all kinds. Put another way, both hieroglyph and diagram are Bilderfahrzeuge, or what Bruno Latour dubs immutable mobiles, and you have to invent, Latour urges, objects which have the properties of being mobile, but also immutable, presentable, readable, and combinable with one another. By hieroglyph, I mean the symbolic form, not the semantic sign. Hor Apollo's hieroglyphs, not Champollion's. By diagram, I mean something more informal, more heuristic than a Kantian schema. Let's see. Ah, more heuristic, sorry, more heuristic than a Kantian schema or, or the plates of a figured, or figured system of the encyclopédie. As such, hieroglyphs and diagrammatics make different cognitive demands, offer different epistemological rewards. Hieroglyphs condense meanings. Diagrams dilate and con dilate and condense them. Following Renaissance and more recent exegetes, we can say that in parsing hieroglyphic images, one plays the detective, iconographer and allegorist. They require close reading and looking. Whereas diagrams, Franco Moretti contends, involve distant reading and looking. They defy iconography, but lend themselves to what Tom Mitchell calls a diagrammatology. Hieroglyphs invite encyclopedic explication. Kierker's massive Oedipus Aegyptiaklus explicates this single inscription. But diagrams, Eclipse context to show formal, causal, and spatial temporal connections. To interpret most diagrams, one exceeds to the processorial, processorial, logical movement depicted. But many diagrams, like Walburg's provisional ones, encourage digression and the creation of new networks and new matrices. For Warburg, hieroglyph and diagram figure conflicting expressive values. Barely animated pathos formulas, hieroglyphs are atavistic, necessary from a historical, cultural, or Viconian perspective, but dangerously hermetic. As astrological images, hieroglyphs of fate, Schicksal's hieroglyphen, riddle Warburg's Schiffenoia and Luther essays, the snake ritual talk, and is also his famous image series, or Bilderreihen. An excessively subjective form of pictorial writing, hieroglyphs determinist, determinist, deterministically fuse, fuses words and images, thus demanding further mediation, indeed often by, the diag by diagrammatics. In remembering astrology's dichotomy of magic and mathematics, Walburg discovers how horoscopes and astrological maps already, already variously mediate hieroglyphic images. If 
Dora's Orpheus rescues a pathos formula from mannerist gestural superlatives. Then when Walburg later contemplates Dora's magic square in the Luther essay, or, or his cosmographical map in various Bilderreihen, hieroglyphs migrate towards diagrams. Briefly put, the late Walburg thinks more diagrammatically than iconographically. This diagrammatic turn ranges from the material and visual aspects of his manuscripts to the images he deploys in public exhibitions and lectures. Yet such diagrams often complicate and disorient. Like the horoscopes he studies, they function as rebuses and ramifying modes of thought. This should not surprise, though, given Walburg's writing style. If his works for publication are philological, marked by iconographic thick description that let objects talk, then especially in writing not meant for publication, his infamously difficult Schreibweise has both hieroglyphic and diagrammatic objects, aspects. His ideographic metaphoric style is marked by paratactical and pointed syntax, extreme verdictung, ingenious antitheses, neologisms, and composites but also by constant diagrammatic combinatory furor. Or to borrow terms Warburg adopts from John Powell, given his visual wit, given how visual wit consists of a timeless dialectic, one that conflates magic and logic, the body's spiritual yearnings and spirit's corporeal desires, the diagrat diagrammatic would represent this chiasmic polarity in ways a nascent Kulturwissenschaft can manipulate. Such contingency also explains why Walburg neglects John Powell's discussion of wit as tiefsinn, profundity, pensiveness, wit that strives after identity, not resemblances. Identities for Walburg are too static, too unmediated, or what amounts to the same thing, too metaphysical. In remembering images, he invents instead complementary modes of induction, Umfangsbestimmung and Orientierung to meditate between, mediate between self and world. For Walburg, the hieroglyph remains an active synchronic force. Yet, as Hermann Newt, he also plays the ironic cybernaut, plays Momus, as the Bruno notebook puts it, who diagrams digressive paths through cultural history shaped by recursive dynamograms. In between hieroglyph and diagram, Denkfiguren and Bildereier flourish. In between hieroglyph and diagram, endless metonymic permutations soliciting empathy and the conscious creation of distance thrive. In between hieroglyph and diagram, Walburg grasps after Bezonnenheit, that ever elusive methodological, psychological, ethical, and spiritual ideal. In this Zwischenraum, as the introduction to the Nemozune Atlas ponderously declares, quote, the fate of human culture, end quote, hangs in the balance. Part two. With an engraver's help, Vico invents a, a diagrammatic drawing littered with hieroglyphs to introduce his new science. But to comprehend the drawing, one must read the entire book. Conversely, to understand Walburg's notion of hieroglyph, one must first grasp how symbols, as pathos formulas, as energetically charged dynamograms, reanimate cultural memories and give expressive form to imminent experience. Walburg judges the symbolic energy of hieroglyphs to be tied off, abgeschnürt, from the phenomenon themselves. In a book dear to Walburg, Karl Gillo, details how symbolic meanings associated with Egyptian hieroglyphs help shape Renaissance art, thought and art, particularly via, via Horopalo's Hieroglyphica, which of course Dora illustrated, Valeriano's Hieroglyphica, arguably the first dictionary of symbols, and Colonna's Hypnoratomachia Polyphili, whose animated fusion of word and image long fascinates Fahrburg almost in the same way that Darwin fascinates him, I mean, it, from the very beginning to the end of his, of his life. Such hieroglyphs compel, Alida Asman adds, because as Denkbilder, they prompt, quote, poetic thinking, wild semiosis, and meditative, meditative immersion, for Senkung. Yet while Walburg does regard hieroglyph in this neo-Renaissance manner as symbolic rather than semiotic, he refuses, for fear it seems, to plunge 
or, or for fear it seems of drowning, to plumb the allegorical depths favored by others. Instead, when Fahlberg writes hieroglyphs, he designates a species of unmediated, abstractly deterministic symbolism. His Nachleben der Antike involves the restitution of, of Greco-Roman expressive values, not pseudo-Egyptian ones. Where Ficino, Kierker, Herder, Benjamin, and Wind find mysterious Tiefsinn, Walburg sees static superstition. In an 1895 text on Italian Renaissance theater costumes, Walburg regrets, quote, the failure of hieroglyphic symbolism and equates it with the Baroque. In, a 1912, in the, his 1912 lecture on the Schifanoia frescoes, he contrasts their fine balancing of humanistic detail and cosmographical themes with early 15th century German almanacs. Quote, these, following the Hellenistic Arabic view, typically offer seven planetary images which affect astrological believers like hieroglyphs of fate in an oracular book. This reduction of celestial science to schicksal hieroglyphen is then invidiously compared with the classical view that permits artists like Cosa and Botticelli, quote, an enthralling sense of reality. As for method, Walburg's iconological analysis is not, quote, the solution of a Bilderrätsel, but scorning, but scorning border police restrictions seeks to expand, quote, the boundaries of our Kunstwissenschaft in material and spatial respects. While Walburg incorrectly induces that the Perseus figure in Kosa's fresco is a disguised Indian Deccan, this error is virtuous, the price of experimentally trespassing into new disciplines. Commenting on a or, quote, or Egyptian deformation of Perseus in a horoscopic schema by Piero de Bano, he writes, quote, Perseus, the deliverer, has turned into a specter who terrorizes the Patafamilius and his wife. Pers of his wife, astrological myth has crumbled into hieroglyphs. Thus, with, with Saxel's tabular assistance, Walburg uses iconog iconography and diagrammatics to show where art and interpretation become too fantastic, too hieroglyphic, where they fail to reconcile the classical past and the imminent present. The astrological imagination neglects empirical orientation. Instead, each sign becomes a tied-off metaphor, or quoting Walburg, quoting Uzna, who's paraphrasing Vico, a special deity. Leaping across more disciplinary and geographical and chronological borders, Walburg at the end of the snake ritual talk compares the hieroglyphic representation of Asclepius in a 13th century Spanish astrological calendar with the radical magical attempts of the Indians to approximate the snake. These symbolic forms are identical since both constitute, quote, an act of cosmological fantasy, end quote. Walburg responds to such magical thinking and indeed to the powerful agency of images, not only with his own metonymies, but also with a Viconian take on symbolic images. Quote, where perplexed human suffering looks for redemption, the snake is found close by as an explanatory pictorial cause. And though this international Antwort symbol belongs to, quote, a surpassed preliminary stage of evolution, it persists in Walburg's critical imagination. Decrying the contemporary destruction by distance annihilating technology of space for devotion or thought, he takes comfort seemingly in history's recursivity. Alternately, alternatively, six years later, Walburg celebrates how Giordano Bruno's words and images transform exorbitant hieroglyphic astrological calendars into, quote, a playground of atomistic lawful momentum. The diagrammatic but hieroglyphic Serai Babarica thus becomes a heuristic empirical Denkraum where Bruno and now Walburg discover new forms of orientation. All the more remarkable then, that Giorgio Agamben effectively offers a hieroglyphic reading of the Nemozune Atlas. His theory of signatures, his, his essay, Theory of Signatures, considers how the Schifanoia essay is informed by the 13th century Latin Arabic Picatrix, where, quote, 
Imagines are neither signs nor reproductions of anything. They are operations through which the forces of celestial bodies are gathered and concentrated into a point in order to influence terrestrial bodies. Given such operators, interpretation becomes a quasi-magical act of sympathy. Arguing by analogy, Agamben then contends that the individual images in the atlas also do not represent. On the contrary, quote, they have value in themselves. Perhaps, but I would counter that they acquire their expressive energy via diagrammatic dispositio more than any theory of signification. Part three. In the culture of diagram, John Bender and Michael Marinin assert, quote, a diagram is a proliferation of manifestly selective packets of dissimilar data correlated in an explicitly process-oriented array that has some of the attributes of a representation, but is situated in the world like an object. Diagrams are closer in kind to Jackson Pollock than to Rembrandt. As a dynamic but reductive means of conveying information, diagrams make visible a process, be it a machine's construction, a species evolution, a logical deduction, or a motif's migration. But trip painting aside, how might Renaissance painting be diagrammatic? Various types of Renaissance perspective are surely diagrammatic. So are preparatory sketches and studies. Allegorical paintings, still lives, diptychs, triptychs, and fresco cycles also have diagrammatic elements that condense and convey heterogeneous data to create second order meetings. Conversely, art historical interpretation can be diagrammatic. Heinrich von Geimüller maps French Renaissance architectural history with this fascinating diagram. Otto Neurath's revolutionary 1938 exhibit on Rembrandt for a Dutch department store consists solely of charts like these. Vaborg's notebooks, drafts of lectures, and toggle book confirm just how crucial diagrams are in his thinking process in placing and displacing culture's light shots. The various cognitive motions marking his thought condense themselves, Thomas Hensel observes, Quote, in diagrams in which Valborg makes the attempt to cobble together far-flung spatio-temporal relations and give them a meaningful structure, end quote. Preferring symbols with clear outline, Valborg tries to transpose this clarity to his diagrams and eventually build a Ryan. Indeed, the latter may well function apotropaically to obviate the power, the, the, the power of fateful images. As the Nemozuni introduction insists, by the early Renaissance, thanks to Hellenistic astrology, quote, the clear, natural Greek pantheon had congealed into a mob of monstrous shapes. To awaken these grotesque hieroglyphs of fate from their opacity and restore them to human believability was the pressing demand of a time which now also demanded that antiquity's rediscovered world have stylistic measured organic visibility. Walborg responds himself to this pressing demand by thinking diagrammatically, even rhizomatically, by by attempting to construct an iconologie des Visionraums. In saying rhizomatically, I mean to invoke Deleuze, Echo, and of course, Georges Didi Ubermann. For the metonymic meanings that Warburg's diagrams and Bilderreihen create are far more digressive, far less synthetic than say either Gombrich or Panofsky could bear. Especially in Valborg's late work, diagrammatics supplement iconography as diagrams devalue context to swiftly signal formal, thematic, and historical similarities and differences. His diagrams would objectify the anachronic force of dynamograms. Yet like his Denkbilder, they too often verge on a private language. Kept intermittently between 1888 and 1912, the notebook Fundamental Fragments for a Monistic Psychology of Art contain, contains dozens of drawings, tables, and diagrams, some of which are comparable, Didi Ubermann observes, to diagrams by Nietzsche, Husserl, and Freud. Another contemporary notebook, Symbolism as Determination of Scope, nomically traces how the symbol variously bridges the gap between subject and object. 
emblemizing this is the 1899 half-circle diagram captioned symbolic behavior, Verhalten, the interval between differentiation and static behavior. Remaking previous diagrams, hence the Bessozo at the top of the page, the larger drawing charts and then with directional arrows sets into circular motion the timeless polarity between seven kinds of dynamics and corresponding forms of statics. In the process, Walburg configures the crucial Zwischenzustand, where various kinds of symbolic action occur. So while Kassir in the 1920s dedicates his voluminous philosophy of symbolic forms to explicating all this symbolic activity, here, decades earlier, a radically synoptic Walburg fashions a single diagram. But even this is too dilated. At the page's bottom, he writes, the circular figure is not characteristic, rather. Then he draws a single icon symbolizing the productive tensions between dynamics and statics. An icon signposting also the contingent means of traversing the symbolic realm, namely individual mobility, quote unquote. In short, hieroglyph and diagram here become mobile forms of self-expression. Further, as Cornelia Zumbusch suggests, this, quote, carefully cross-hatched drawing of a trunk with two branches may also be a pictorial transposition of Jean Paul's polarity of logic and magic. Corresponding to the next phase of Walburg's research, the turning point when he shifts attention from fine art to astrological images is the notebook Schemata Pathos Formulas, Sassetti Dura, 1905-1911. Here, Walburg experiments with both tabular and spatial, spatiotemporal diagrams. The four-page table, schematism of pathos formulas, has vertical columns listing different pathos formulas, and then horizontal rows listing various artists. The resulting boxes are set to be filled with specific artworks conforming to the schema, but typically most remain empty. The spatiotemporal diagram is exemplified by two folios titled The Antique World of Gods and the Early Renaissance in the South and North. Here, a loosely genealogical chart also traces the geographic disposition of such Nachleben. Having visually distilled this historical phenomenon, Walburg on the next page scribbles a discursive outline of the lecture, later published in the Gesammelte Schriften. Here, palpably, palpably, diagram becomes discovery. In the Skifanoia essay, Walburg summarizes his argument by having Mary, Mary Walburg redraw the, quote, system of frescoes. Alternatively, a 1927 Tagebuch entry remakes cartographic schemas to make visible, quote, the residents of the Mediterranean basin in the battle for mathematical thought space, the winning back of metaphoric distance. Part map part flowchart and journal entry, this diagram visualizes the development of European early modern cosmology by tracking how ancient Greek astronomy shifted in the Alexandrian era, Alexandrian era towards barbarism, and then how this shift, propelled chiefly by Islamic culture, came to shape the metaphoric cosmological denkraum of Renaissance Europe. I don't have the time to make discursive sense of all this, but I do want to indicate first how Walburg slyly indicates himself as a resident by underlining the W in the KBW situated in the Northwest. Second, how this schema audaciously, audaciously concludes when the battle for metaphoric distance is compared to the Last Supper in the bottom, in the text in the bottom. The phrase significat ora est refers to the Eucharist, a symbolic act that helped tear 16th century Europe, Europe apart. Metaphor is no mere hobby horse, therefore. Rather, this diagram argues it constructs the very Wanderstrassen thought and expression follow. But how do diagrams help Walburg win back metaphoric distance? In 1981, Tom Mitchell queries, if we cannot get it form except through the meditation of mediation of things like diagrams, do we not then need something like a diagrammatology, a systematic study of the ways that relationships among elements are represented and interpreted by graphic constructions? 
Such a diagrammatology would, would, he adds, be a sort of Wittgensteinian description of how literature's spatial form represents, quote, something that occurs in virtual or mental space, uncanny uh, uh, relation with Warburg Stinkraum. More recently, Franco Moretti treats diagrammatology as, quote, comparative morphology. Here, graphs, maps, and trees precipitate new forms of reading, knowing, and then displaying, not what happens in a single text, but what transpires over the life of a literary genre, especially as it migrates geographically. Moretti thus undertakes distant readings that examine conceptual forest rather than textual details. A complete diagrammatology of Walburg's words and images would graph familiar conceptual polarities, but also how diagrams function as forms of invention and arrangement. It would map pathos formulas and their material builder Fahrzeuge within shifting cultural contexts and larger actor networks. It would enable us to better see critical objects and the critic himself functioning as immutable mobiles and it would help us to see how diagram becomes atlas. Fourth and final part. From 1924 on, Walburg pursues more labile, experimental, yet accessible forms of knowing and showing. The diagrammatics that had long fueled his private thinking and writing increasingly inform public efforts to explain his Kulturwissenschaft. Shunning scholarly publication, Walburg transforms the orderly but neverable, never perfectible syntax of the table into looser, more heuristic, more dynamic forms. As Didi Ubermann tells it, with Walburg's earlier schema, schemas thwarted, he turns, down, he turns now to, quote, non-schematic montage to define a field that he thought of as rigorously trans-iconographical. To my mind, the trans iconography of the Bilderreihe technique consists in its cartographic pretensions, in its ability to make expressive values palpable while carefully setting them in combinatory motion, whether via individual panels or sequences of panels, and so ultimately in a dialectic of distillation and dilation. By diagramming and concretizing formal, thematic, and spatial-temporal relations between exemplary artifacts, Walburg configures an anachronic paradigm for cultural history. He constructs a phenomenological, psychological Zwischenraum in which he consciously, ironically, always tentatively, creates just enough distance from the multitudinous power, from the build act of hieroglyphs of fate. As a practical matter, this heuristic process commences with the numerous combinatory sketches Walburg makes to facilitate the invention and arrangement of individual images. Here is a sketch from the 1927 Ovid exhibition, a Bilderreihe stamped by extraordinary violence, recursive tragedy, and the Christian inversion of both. Here, the Ovidian receptacle mirror so central to Walburg's thought is refocused to condense and arrange pathos formulas associated with sacrificial dance and lament. And here, diagram is transformed as image and word, note the books on the bottom of the page, of the, of the screen, are, repre are represented and combined. Now the format Walburg chooses to turn sketches into exhibitable objects encourages viewers to focus on formal qualities and not to be distracted by chromatic, contextual, or medial differences. Permutating pathos formulas are ostensibly disposed in ways that invite new forms of critique. Like the 19th century atlases studied by Lorraine Dastin and Peter Gallison, the panels of the Bilderreihen are working objects, quote unquote. Displacing iconography, these panels create their own internal metonymic meanings. Conversely, as artifacts, the thousand images in the last version of the Nemozuni Atlas retain hieroglyphic aspects. The poor quality of the reproductions and the lack of identifying information lessen the image's expressive power, yet solicit endless interpretive labor and play. As artifacts, individual panels resemble emblems, especially when Walburg or Bing take the title of the panels and identify individual images, as with the Ovid Ausstellung, or as the editors do in the Akademie edition. 
The mise en page of this edition also works diagrammatically and emblematically. The former is self-evident. As for the latter, Bing's abbreviated titles function as the mottos. The photographs of panels provide the images, while the captions, drawing on Walburg's published and unpublished writings, but also potentially the library informing them, and hopefully our own inexhaustible digital archive, form the encyclopedic subscripts. Put another way, just as a symbol bridges internal and external worlds, so would the diagrammatic at atlas with its, quote, representation of internal and external animated life, end quote. Indeed, a startling number of individual images are diagrammatic, images meant to be used rather than interpreted per se, images that orient more than captivate. The three opening panels dedicated to orienting us in the cosmos and with the atlas's syntax consist almost exclusively of visual schemas, cartographic, astrological, genealogical, and iatro-mathematical diagrams ambiguously, no elliptically, yield to astronomical diagrams and newspaper layouts. Time is short, I realize that, but I would note how panel 22 contains the same diagrammatic image from the Spanish astrological calendar that Vaborg invokes in the snake ritual talk, and how to help, a more, to help tell a more synoptic story of cultural mobility, it's now constellated with six other images from the same manuscript and three more from contemporary Spanish and French texts. Or how panel 23 features astrological allegorical frescoes from the Salone in Padua, whose diagrammatic aspects are underscored by the juxtaposition of a schematic drawing of the cosmos per Dante, Dante's Commedia, or how panel 26 combines diagrammatic images with Schicksal hieroglyphen, while panel 27 supplements the drawing used to clarify the Schifanoia frescoes, or to stretch the notion of a diagram a bit, how panels 61, 61 slash 64 and 79 feature images that function as panels themselves, thereby drawing attention to the comparative process itself. Walborg's Bilderreihen invite distant look looking, or at least oscillation between close and distant looking. Further, they anticipate our own episteme in which making surface connections rules, in which making surface connections rules. Yet they also proleptically undermine such superficiality. Steeped in the same philological tradition that produced the great comparatist, Curtius, Spitzer, and Auerbach, Walborg prizes the detail as Leibniz did the monad, both when properly explicated, open, limitless fields of meaning. If his diagrams devalue the detail insofar as they instrumentally seek Umfangsbestimmung and Orientierung, then when Warburg places photographic images within diagrammatic structures, he explicitly promotes a new kind of seeing, a future iconology, if you will. His comparative morphology thrives within carefully constructed cultural and spatial-temporal frames, even as it draws on memories of immersive, close looking and reading. Like his library, which cultivates the philological ideal and encourages surprising metonymies, his Bilderreihen assume iconographic experience, even as they aspire to that self-conscious creation of distance, which permits more dynamic, more mobile perspectives. Finally, such diagrammatic mobility is both personal and cultural. It involves the artifacts themselves and the hermeneutes. For the late Warburg, it enables new inductions, new combinatorial possibilities, while functioning, too, as a kind of apotropaic magic. In, ta in the Tage book entries from, the la from his last months, the phrase Achtung Tiefsinn, or simply the letters AT recurs. One instance even has a drawing of an angel carrying a sign with the letters A-T. In this hieroglyphic, tragic, comic manner, Walborg warns himself away from abyssal contemplation, away from directly wrestling with unresolvable contradictions or with first and last things. In other words, this glyph is also a sign of hope, 
a sign that, like Tobias, who figures so prominently in panel 47, the hermeneut will find a saving angel. Diverting his gaze from iconog iconographic immersion, the late Valborg moves knowingly, passionately, swiftly along metaphoric and metonymic axes between past and present, west and east, north and south, word and image, and so between hieroglyph and diagram as well. Thank you very much.